Uh, something I wish I could have told myself seven or eight years ago was simply pick one strategy, one asset, and pursue it aggressively and get better than everybody else in that space. You can make millions of dollars in any of these niches in real estate and many outside of real estate, but you can't make millions of dollars in all of them. So pick one thing, pursue it aggressively and iterate and adapt and improve as quickly as you can. I love it. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, also the host of the show. And today I have an amazing guest that's going to be joining me to talk about his journey in this world of private money. Well, my guest has raised $500,000 in private money to fund his real estate deals. We're going to dissect exactly how he started out how he overcame some of the challenges when he started out, and how you can duplicate the strategies as well on raising private money for yourself. Well, my guest actually started his real estate investing journey all the way back when he was only 16 years old. Can you imagine? Well, fast forward to the present. He's been buying rentals consistently ever since college, and he's built out this land and development business, which actually continually feeds the acquisition of rentals. Well, in 2019, he quit his day job. How about that? And because of the financial impact of real estate investing, he left his traditional day job employment at the young age of only 23 years old, 23 years old and now has the freedom to work on what he wants without being tied to any kind of sort of employer. So within his real estate world and what he does, he's currently working on a mixture of new development, land investing, consulting, and he's always, of course, on the lookout for a property that makes sense as a long-term buy and hold. In addition to that, he started his blog and his website in 2019 because he wanted to share with people just like you what he's done so others can replicate how he has really, really enjoyed this great success at such a young age. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Dan Habercost, right after this. Well, welcome to the show, Dan. Jay, thanks for having me. I appreciate the intro. Absolutely, man. I'm so excited to have you on. And, you know, you are you have quite the inspiring story because, you know, I know a lot of our listeners can't see you right now as I can. Mm -hmm. um, they may be watching on YouTube and they can see you. But, you know, you look every bit the age of 14 years old. <laughs> oh, <It's> amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hear that often, but uh, I'll take it as a compliment. I'm 27. <laughs> so <laughs> trust, trust me, the older you get, the more you're going to like to hear that compliment. So you're 27 sure. years old right now, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. I love it. I love it. And, you know, because of this thing called real estate investing and giving you the freedom, uh, you moved to Colorado yeah. not too long ago, which is where you've been wanting to move for some time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I moved here in 2018. Love the sun, love the mountains, love the people. Uh, it's quite the improvement over Ohio. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, my story around private money, uh, Carol Joy, my wife and I, we've been investing in in real estate, single family houses primarily, ever since 2003, mm -hmm. uh, full time, we rehabbed a little over 475 houses. Well, I didn't start out raising private money or using private money to fund my real estate deals. In fact, the first six years that uh, we were in the business, I just relied on local banks to fund my deals. But then something came along in my life that changed everything up. It was that thing in 2009 when we had the global financial crisis going on and I lost my lines of credit. That was what forced me into learning about private money. And actually, it was the biggest blessing in disguise ever in our business. We actually were able to triple our income in our business that first year 
we started using private money. Uh, so my question to you, uh, Dan, is did you start out in your real estate investing business using private money? If you didn't, what happened in your career that caused you to start using private money? Yeah, so I'll try and make an important distinction here where I have front range land, which is my active land and development business. That is where I, uh, I use private money and my, my actual investing on the buy and hold side, not as much. So I, I started with picking up a few house hacks, you know, the first one being when I was 21, finishing up college. Um, and, and that was just with my own cash. And shortly thereafter, though, uh, getting to the whole point, I realized the low and no money down stuff is great, but money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, and so that's when I started the active business so that I could scale my income and, and ultimately go and buy more rental properties. And, and front range land, quite simply, is a direct-to-seller marketing business for land. And uh, important distinction there, I don't touch raw land. Everything I go after is horizontally developed, uh, infill, shovel-ready sort of lots. And uh, uh, that uh, is dispoed or, or profited on in a variety of ways. Some of the lots we just buy and sell. Some of the lots, uh, for, for uh, I, I finance them. And then a few at a time, I'll put new construction homes on and or duplexes, but uh, all residential. And when I started doing that, I had very little money of my own. So I absolutely had to seek private investors to fund the land deals. Excellent. So it, again, it was out of necessity, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. So how did you start? Um, tell us the story about your first private lender and how that came about. Was it a family member? Was it a friend? Was it an associate or somebody else? So it was a friend and mentor. So the, the way that I was... Uh, even got into land, into that space, is I, I met a guy here at the local real estate group, which I actually host now, who had been doing land and development all over the country for the last you know, 40, 45 years. And he needed help in his business, uh, specifically on the technology side of things, being a bit older, not having grown up with it. And so I would go down an hour south of where I live and, and meet him where, where he lived every weekend and help him in his business and learn from him. And that is ultimately how I learned to build houses, you know, learn about land, how to go direct to seller to, to buy it. Um, and so eventually I just kind of took his business model and started implementing it myself. And so he financed my first deals. Okay. So it was your mentor mm -hmm. that, uh, that actually was your first private lender. Yep. Um, so what advice would you give to say a new real estate investor that is wanting to raise private money? What advice would you give them? What not to do, what to do, how to, you know, approach a potential private lender? Sure. So don't be short sighted here. He knew everything that I wanted to know, number one. So he was, you know, the consultant, so to speak, along with the lender. And so I gave him half the deals. He was <laughs> he was getting nearly, you know, 50 to 100 percent returns on his money just flipping land in a matter of months. And, and you might say that, that that's crazy. That's, you know, such an obscene rate of return is of course we were just JVing. We weren't violating usury laws. Uh, but point being, it didn't matter how much of the deal I had to give away to get it financed when I was starting. What mattered is that I did those deals, started to learn, started to gain confidence and did it in a way that was very safe. It was safe because again, I had a subject matter expert, providing the money and double checking what I was doing to make sure that I was not making any mistakes. And so the point I'm trying to make isn't necessarily that you have to give away that much of the deal. It is more that when you're new, when you're getting started, if you're able to go find someone who, who doesn't just have the money, but also has the expertise and can double check everything you're doing, don't worry about what you have to give away. What is important at that juncture is that you are doing the deals, you're learning, you're iterating because down the road, those, you know, the money you gave away on the first few does not matter at all. Well, and you know, what you're talking about there uh, is you're talking about learning while you're earning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, you know, along with that, um, I'm particularly starting out when you're new, access to the funding is actually more important than say an interest rate that you're going to pay, mm -hmm. uh, just having access to the funding. Um, now, what I practice and what I teach 
Uh, we pay all of our private lenders a straight 8%, no origination fees, uh, no extension fees. Um, we don't give any part of the back end of the deal. But again, being confident about what you're talking about is another, another really, really important attribute of being able to attract that money into your world. So mm -hmm. in addition to your mentor, have you branched out and you're getting private money from other individuals now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a doctor who he has. Oh, so I gave you the number of half a million because and people who've raised any substantial amount of money know that that's low uh, because I, I use hard money to finance the new construction. So really, I've just used the private lenders to finance uh, the actual acquisition of the land. Uh, but point that I wanted to make is I have far more people offering me money than I have deals and assets to put them in. I have a decent amount of liquidity right now, so we're really ramping up our mail. Um, so yes, I have a couple doctors that have given me cash. I have a few people that have given me cash, kind of like you just described, just with a straight debt, and I pay them every month. And then I have others that I don't pay them anything every month, but they just take a, a portion of the deal when it sells. So I've, I've structured it both ways. And uh, what you just described, though, it sounds like you aggregated a large pool of funds, uh, straight debt, where you simply pay them a return and use it as you... I don't know if there's any boundaries as to how you can use it within your business, but that's really what I'm working towards. Because again, I, I have more people offering me money than I, I have assets to put the money in at this time. Isn't that a wonderful problem? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'd rather have more money than I can use mm -hmm. than more deals than I have with it, you know, than without the funding. So mm -hmm. that doctor or doctors that, that uh, are your private lenders, Mm -hmm. um, how did you, how did they learn about, um, the private money world and how did, how do you start a conversation with someone like that? Sure. So one of them reached out to me off of one of these podcasts. So he had a background in real estate was just at a point in his life where he didn't want to do any of the work. He just wanted to lend the money. So that was easy. He came to me. Um, I have had a few private lenders I've met locally and they were, referred by someone I know, um, or I, you know, I host that real estate group here and we get quite the turnout there. So I've had a few people from that want to lend to me, but to, to get to the point of your question, how do you approach someone? I like to do so a little more passively by simply talking about what I'm doing, the returns that are coming about and that other investors I'm working with are getting. And then if that person sees that as being of interest, they'll, they'll bring that up. So that's how I like to go about it kind of a soft sell. I'm all about what you just said, Dan. Mm -hmm. I'm all about what I call the indirect method. Mm -hmm. Very, very soft. I never ask anybody for money. I never pitch a deal. Uh, we separate the conversations of introducing someone to what this world of private money is and how it works, and then having a deal to fund. Of course, I'm sure you will agree, the worst time to be trying to raise any kind of private money is when you need it yes. for, for a particular deal, right? Yeah. Uh, the best time to be raising private money is when you don't need it and you're not trying to get a deal funded. And so, you know, for example, how in the world do I have all this private money? I've got about eight and a half million dollars uh, accessible uh, for, you know, multiple projects, multiple house projects that we've got going on. And so, first of all, how do we get how do we get the interest? Well, we put on our teacher hat. So mm -hmm. we teach people people that we've got association with. We go to church together. We're in the Rotary Club together. We're in Business Networking International. You know, mm -hmm. our social, you know, our social media friends, et cetera. So we teach people what private money is and how it works and what sure. our program is. I love to start conversations with, did you know? I love did you know questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite did you know questions, just having a casual conversation with someone is, did you know that there's a way people can earn unlimited money per year tax free? And of course, they're not going to know how that works. And then when they say no, my follow up question to that is, well, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? And in all likelihood, they haven't. So now we lead into a conversation of how people can use their current retirement funds, transfer them over to a self-directed IRA. If it's in the form of a Roth IRA, all those returns and profits are after tax dollars. So there's your tax-free income. Mm -hmm. So again, I love to start conversations with, did you know? I love what you just said, Dan. Just tell people what you're doing, right? Yeah. I mean, I've got a ton of friends and students. They'll just simply post on their Facebook mm -hmm. a deal that they're doing, yep. right? 
and let pe and let the story unfold on Facebook or on Instagram. Well, that right there, you don't even have to ask people if they've got an interest. They're going to be saying, well, tell me more about what you've got going on. Right. Mm -hmm. Or on social media, they can refer to a or tell a story about, hey, and just in passing, they'll say, and one of my private lenders funded this deal and they're making X number of dollars just by funding the deal. So you didn't ask for money. You're mm -hmm. just telling people what you do. I love yeah. that point, Dan. Yeah, that, that, that's it. And then on, on uh, more tactical advice, I have found that, you know, doctor is a good example, but people I know who own businesses outside of real estate where they're doing very well, but they're very busy or they're just high paid W-2s are excellent sources for, for capital because they have a lot of cash. They don't know how to multiply it themselves and they think an eight or 10 percent return is great. They're very happy with that. They don't know how to take real estate and get, you know, exponential returns. So uh, look for those busy, high paid professionals or, or business owners outside of real estate. Absolutely. Well, if you're listening to this show, I want to give you right now a gift, a free gift. And it's my book, which is titled Where to Get the Money Now, right? This is not an ebook. I'm actually going to autograph it and mail it to you. And the subtitle is How and Where to Get Your Get money for your real estate deals without relying on hard money or traditional lenders. And you can get this book by going to jconnor.com forward slash book, B O O K. So, again, this is not a downloadable ebook. This is a book I'm actually going to mail to you in the mail just to cover a couple of bucks to cover uh, shipping and handling. Again, that's jconnor, J A Y C O N N E R.com forward slash book. Dan, thank you for sharing your experience on the private money piece. Let's go ahead and move over to your uh, favorite wheelhouse, mm -hmm. which is land. Why land? Well, the honest answer there, we can all justify everything we do in hindsight, but the honest answer there is because I found the expert in it who, who I made friends with and ultimately learned from first and foremost. But there are certainly advantages to land in that it's more of a blue ocean. It's highly inefficient. It's not well understood. People who don't know what they're talking about will say land is risky or new development, new builds are risky, which I'll tell you, it's far easier to build a new home than to go flip a house. I've done heavy rehabs. You don't know what you're going to find under the under the floor, under the walls with a, a simple box. It's the same box every time. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the concept of being an inefficient market is the point I want to make where there aren't a lot of competent high level players, whereas you go into something, say, like multifamily. Right. There are a huge amount of very competent players. It's very consolidated. Uh, that is certainly not the case with land. And then just the category of land is so broad. And there are so many different moves and, and assets under that umbrella that, uh, I mean, shoot, I certainly don't play in all the arenas there. Uh, I focus on infill, uh, horizontally developed lots. I don't touch raw land. And that's, again, an underappreciated, under served space and there's all kinds of builders needing lots but they don't know how to get them and i was on the phone with dr horton uh their southwest florida land acquisition rep because they're buying one of my lots and they're buying like crazy and they will even pay a premium in a lot of these markets because they take 90 days to close and so they're not unique in that builders build that's what they know how to do that's where they make their returns so they're happy to pay market price for land which is excellent when you think about other niches in real estate if you go direct to seller for housing or apartments and you want to sell that or flip that your end user is going to want a discount and that's generally not the case with builders their version of a discount is you know 90 95 percent of uh, market price so they don't really know how to buy at a discount and then as an, uh, a corollary to that when i go to build and i've got both a discount on the land and then uh, an effective general contractor there are, are huge margins to be made uh, so I know that was a bit of a rant, but there are, are quite a few reasons why I like this space. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest reasons I heard is you don't have a lot of competition out there going after the asset that you're going after. Yeah, not not relative to other spaces in, in real estate. It's certainly gotten busier these last few years, especially in the southeast. But not a lot of competent money is in the space. It's people that don't have money. They're trying to wholesale. Um, and so. It's uh, a good space to be in for that reason. And then especially on the, the new construction side, uh, especially in a lot of these small metros I'm in, there's opportunity there. New, new builds are very, very simple if we're just talking 1,500 square foot ranches. Right. 
So share with us some of your secret sauce. Uh, how do you find the lots? How do you get the list? How do you market to these owners of these lots? Sure. So big picture, anytime you want to market for anything, you need to know who are you marketing to? And you need to align both your marketing pieces, your messaging, and your negotiation accordingly. And this is where a lot of people go wrong in land. So there is some distress out there, but I'll tell you, we get far more deals from people in the 70s and 80s who are at least upper middle class, if not wealthy, because they bought this for cash 10 or 20 years ago, and whose time is far more important to them than their money. We don't get much distress. And so knowing that, all of our mail is uh, very much aligned to that. There's all kinds of offers, you know, postcards, mail pieces talking about cash and quick clothes. And that sounds scammy, especially to the oldest demographic, which tends to be the target of scams. And so PropStream is where I pull my data. My uh, the, the list I would start with if I was going into a new market uh, is 10 plus years owned, living out of state or out of county. I'd want them to own, you know, two or th three properties max, right? You don't want the builder who owns 20 properties on your list, at least to start. Um, and then not listed on the MLS. So those are the parameters. And then uh, I use just the drawing tool on PropStream to pull an area, um, which of course we can talk more in depth about. And then you pull the data, data I upload it directly into my CRM Pebble. And uh, Pebble mails right uh, out of the CRM for me. I have been using six by nine postcards mostly this year. They're bright, they're colorful, they get your attention. Um, and we do some cold calling, but most of our deals come via mail, sending about 10,000 mail pieces a month. And uh, it's really that simple. Uh, the other thing I would say too, especially in these more competitive areas like Florida and North Carolina, you need to know what you're talking about. This drives me nuts. Again, I, I learned about land from the uh, perspective of actually building homes. That's what I was doing with, with my older friend. And um, I see so many land courses and people in land who can't tell you what a perk test is or what plot plans are or a plat. They don't know anything about building. They don't know anything about utility available. No, not, they, don't, they don't have a clue. And you need to know because if you want to rise above the competition, you need to actually know what you're talking about because you're talking to sellers who probably do. And especially on the dispo side, if you're trying to sell to builders. And you need to have, again, your negotiations aligned according to your avatar and to their pain points. So if I'm trying to harp on, oh, I can close quickly, you need cash, I have cash, I'm going to fail with the people that we buy from because that's not what they care about. They're not in a hurry. They're not distressed. What they need is, hey, I'm the target of scams all the time. I have money. I'm not as technologically savvy. I need to know that you're legitimate. You're not trying to scam me. And then you're actually going to close because I'm so tired of all these fake people who don't have money trying to make me offers. So aligning everything to the avatar is very, very key to getting deals. So instead of that messaging, in uh, essence, or essentially, what is your messaging that's not what you just went over? Legitimacy, right? So right on my postcard, it says tired of fake offers. We send proof of funds and our attorney or title company, depending on the state, handles escrow, eliminating all risk for either party. Here's our website. You know, here's our e everything. Just uh, uh, that is a, a good tagline because they're sick of people that don't have money trying to get their property under contract. Yeah. So you are not the first person that has sent them a direct mail piece. No, not in the southeast. There's been some. Markets I've been in out here in Colorado and New Mexico where it's far less busy. Um, but I don't think there's anyone, at least in the last year, I've mailed. It hasn't been mailed before or hasn't been mailed recently. Sure. Do you mail them one time or more than once? Many times. So in places that are producing, to be clear, you know, if we send a ton of mail and, and the market doesn't work out or let's say the market's slowing down and nothing's selling, we'll stop. But for places that are producing, I'll hit them every three to four months. Okay, once every three or four months. And how do you structure your offer? How do you how do you determine what you will pay for a lot? And it sounds like most of what you're buying are lots. Yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of a spectrum. And I have an SOP sheet for this that my acquisition guys have where in somewhere like most markets we're in in Florida are much hotter. They move quicker. They're they're really commoditized because there tend to be thousands of infill lots that are exactly the same in these subdivisions. And so those ones, there's endless amounts of builders, there's endless amounts of demand. We can 
tend to be a little higher. A lot of times we buy them at 50, 50 cents, of the, 55 cents of the dollar. Whereas in some of these markets in, in New Mexico, especially, or uh, North Carolina, where it's a little more all over the place as far as size and zoning and some have flood zones and some have wetlands and there's just more variables. It's less of a uh, homogenous subdivision. Uh, a lot of times we need to be a little more conservative and be more in the 35 to 45 cents on the dollar range. But again, it's more of a, it's not a perfect science. Sure. Now you were saying that you mail about 10,000 pieces a month, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So on average, what, how did the statistics play out? And this may vary from market to market, but how many pieces have you got to mail to buy a lot? I just did a whole talk on this at my real estate group. And honestly, Jay, having a basic understanding of statistics, I don't think I can accurately give you that number because we're in over a dozen markets. And if I'm dividing 10,000 mailers over a dozen markets, you know, call it so 120,000 a year over a dozen markets. It's hard to get a true average, a true regression to the mean. It's higher in Florida. It's lower in North Carolina and New Mexico. But do I really have, you know, thinking thinking back to statistics, right? The law of large numbers, you, you, you need a big number to get a true regression to a real average. I don't know that I have a good one for you. It appears to be in the 12 to 15 ish hundred in uh, Florida and closer to maybe 800 to 1,000 in North Carolina and even lower in New Mexico, but I haven't done a ton of business there. Colorado, I, I've uh, only been mailing where I'm actually building, so I don't have good numbers for you there. But uh, I, I, I hope you get the point I'm making where if I was sending a million mailers a month, I could give you a really clear, hey, this is our average. But only sending 10,000 a month to a bunch of different markets, it, it's hard to give you a clear answer there. So, Sure, I get it. And so if you're not going, if, so when you buy a lot, if you're mm -hmm. not going to build on it yourself, mm -hmm. what's your favorite disposition uh, strategies to, to sell that lot? Just reselling it on the market. Um, and you just put it in the MLS? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's not rocket science, is it? No, <laughs> no this stuff is not, is not complicated. Um, sometimes we'll sell it for turns. I haven't done an assignment in a long time. They just, there's nothing wrong with it. It just kind of makes me uncomfortable. Occasionally we'll do that. Um, I've funded some double closes, but uh, yeah, mostly just buy and sell sometimes for terms, sometimes for cash. Right. Well, you started your, um, you started your blog, your website back in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you are a go giver, right? Just like the book, the go giver and tell people, tell us all about your blog, what that's mm -hmm. about and why people should check it out and what they'll learn when they go to your website and your blog. So for years, I've, I've um, read Howard Marks's memos. And for anyone who doesn't know what he is, he's uh, similar to Warren Buffett. That would be someone everyone knows who, who would be a good analogy. And uh, he writes quarterly, approximately memos, just talking about his business, what he's doing, what he's seeing, what they're, uh, uh, you know, advising for their clients. And so my blog is the same thing. It's me simply talking about deals I'm doing in my business today and, and you know, lessons learned from specific deals, that sort of thing. Because, uh, of course, uh, I certainly don't have the track record of the person I'm referencing, but over the course of decades, I expect I will. And so I enjoy kind of just sharing my, my thoughts there. And some people hopefully will find that useful. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I'm writing about on there. Sure. And how do people find uh, your website and your blog? DanHaberkos.com on the socials or just the DanHaberkos.com is my website. There you go. So for people that are listening, we're going to spell that out nice and slowly. So that's, and of course, it'll be in the show notes as well. But that's www.dan, D-A-N, Haberkos, H-A-B-E-R, K-O-S-T.com, Dan Habercost.com. Dan, final parting words. Well, uh, something I wish I could have told myself seven or eight years ago was simply pick one strategy, one asset, and pursue it aggressively and get better than everybody else in that space. You can make millions of dollars in any of these niches in real estate and many outside of real estate but you can't make millions of dollars in all of them. So pick one thing, pursue it aggressively and iterate and adapt and improve as quickly as you can. I love it, Dan. My advice of what you just said, I say in three words, learn, 
your lane. Yes. Learn your lane. Mm-hmm. Stay in your lane. And when you learn that lane, then you can explore another lane. Mm-hmm. Right? But stay in that one lane to begin with. Well, congratulations to you, Dan, with all the success that you're already enjoying. I know you are an inspiration to a lot of people. That's fantastic that you're running your real estate investing group out there in Colorado. And um, and I know from uh, just being with you here on the show today, uh, you are a leader and you're blazing the trail for a lot of other folks to follow in your steps. Thank you for being a go-giver and for giving back. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate you having me. It was a great conversation. You got it, Dan. Well, there you have it, my friends. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm your host, the Private Money Authority, and I need your help so that we can have more amazing guests like we've had with Dan today. If you are listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow and give us a five-star rating. Write us a short little review. would be fantastic. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out on any more of our upcoming episodes. So I'm here to inspire you as well, to help you take your business to the next level. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right back here again on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.